So good things kicked off. Um, this presentation today is actually based off of a blog post that I did not too long ago. Um, so most of this information is in the blog format if you prefer reading it as well. I am going to highlight a few additional things today in the session and also show the actual workflows live with Fusion 360. Um, that way you can sort of see what the workflow looks like start to finish instead of just segments. So we're going to be mostly talking about how we can better um, handle chaining geometry for milling toolpaths, as well as creating boundaries and containment for three and surfacing toolpaths. And some of the um, kind of the fine tuning you can do and some of the more advanced options that you can get into. Um, so about myself, uh, if you haven't sat in on any of my other webcasts, uh, I do work as a manufacturing applications expert at Imagine It. Um, I've been here about five years now. I worked as a mechanical engineer in several industries and I have sort of a um, design product development as well as manufacturing background. So I do a lot of work um, within the Autodesk softwares um, for FEA and CAM. So you'll find me assisting uh, with sales as well as uh, benchmarking for um, Inventor Nastran, CFD, uh, pretty much the entire CAM suite. So Fusion, which we'll get into today, Inventor CAM, Feature CAM, Power Mill, all the way down the line. And then I do some generative design work with Fusion 360 quite often. Um, they've added a lot of new functionality there that I have been spending a lot of time with lately. I'm based in Denver, Colorado, so ski season is just wrapping up, um, but the uh, mountain bike's coming out of the garage soon, so looking forward to getting some time outside soon. So if you're not familiar with Imagine It, before I get into uh, the rest of this presentation, just wanted to give you guys a brief overview of what Imagine It does and what we uh, provide for our clients. So we are a uh, platinum uh, reseller. We've been working with Autodesk for a long time. Um, we work with a lot of customers in a lot of different industries. You'll see us assisting um, with Autodesk's entire platform. So we work with architectural com companies, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, manufacturing, and design. Um, we're one of the largest providers. Um, so our job is to help you find the software that you need, but also provide support and sort of build a relationship with you. So we have a full dedicated support team. So if you have quick questions, uh, or need support using your software, we have a dedicated team to that. So you're not gonna be scrambling to find answers. And we also have um, dedicated technical experts like myself, um, as well as a customer advocacy team so that we can work with you and also get answers from Autodesk and get them involved when necessary on more advanced questions. Um, we provide training, we provide consulting and implementation. So if you need help implementing a new workflow um, or product data management, product uh, life cycle management, things like that, we can assist. We can also provide training for the software. So if you need advanced training or beginning training, fundamentals training, we have several training centers and we can also come on site and assist you there. So we have a lot of experience. We have a lot of um, experts and sales account managers that have a lot of experience and can really understand uh, what your company does, your process, and help you to find ways to reduce costs um, through either product knowledge, so improving uh, your ability to use software through training, or looking at your workflow and identifying ways that we can streamline or automate any of the things that you're doing um, so that you can boost your productivity, profitability, um, and really um, use the software to your advantage. So looking at some of our solutions, like I said, we work within um, BIM, we work within building lifecycle management, we do CAM, so we do a lot of um, CAM programming, benchmarking, as well as post-processor services. Uh, we can assist with your FEA simulations or your CFD simulations, whether that is uh, consulting or training. We help with data management. Uh, we work a lot with Autodesk Vault implementations and streamlining your data management. We also have a full software development team. So if there's a plugin or a capability that the software can't do, but you want it to be added in, we can actually develop plugins for Inventor um, and AutoCAD and things like that to uh, improve how the software works for your industry or your company. 
And again, we do full implementation services so we can come on site and assist with whatever you need. We also have a e-learning platform. So if you don't have time for an in-person training, we have an e-learning platform called Productivity Now that allows you to learn at your own pace. And it has all of the same training content that you could get from a live instructor, um, but in a really easy to use platform and you can sort of go at it at your own pace on your own time. So if you have any other questions about Imagine or what we do um, and how we help our, our customers, you know, feel free to reach out and I'll provide all of our contact info at the end of the session. So some of the things we're going to cover today. So let's get into Fusion 360. One of the biggest things that I'm going to talk about today is there's a new feature in Fusion 360 um, that correlates to the geometry selection. This new module has been built into almost all of the 2D and 3D tool paths, and it allows you to um, choose how you want to select geometry, but you can also now combine methods so that you can chain geometry or automatically recognize pockets within the same tool path. It also has an improved user interface that makes it a lot easier and a little bit less confusing, in my opinion. Um, so we'll talk about that new feature uh, that was released early this year. I believe it came out in the January 2023 release. We'll talk a little bit about 2D feature chains and stock contours. So I'll get into 2D uh, pocketing and roughing and contouring tool paths and sort of how the new selection methods play out when you're using those. We'll also talk about 3D boundaries. Obviously, 3D machining is a lot more complicated, especially when it comes to creating boundaries and limits. Uh, you have a little bit more work to do when you're containing your tool. It's not quite as automatic as a 2D feature because the feature itself is more complicated. We'll talk also about tool containment and slope parameters, which can be added in addition to your limits to really fine tune your toolpath and create a surfacing toolpath that is exactly what you want so that you're not having to um, tweak it um, too much prior to running it on your machine. So let's talk a little bit about this new feature. So this is new in Fusion 360. This will show up in the geometry tab. So your second tab over, uh, you will see uh, pocket selections and there's this new drop down menu that gives you access to all the different tools. It used to be you can just chain geometry together or you could choose a pocket and that was it. Now you can select exactly what method you want to use before you even begin and you can group together multiple selections in the same window here. So it's much more modular and you can customize exactly how you want to approach it. So you'll see a couple of new options, face contours, pocket recognition, silhouette, and sketch profiles. Those are the new methods. And this gives you a little bit more automation and can save you some time when you're needing to select multiple pockets uh, or choose a, a silhouette on a complex part. So you can combine these within the same operation and you'll see this same drop down menu when you go to choose stock contours and when you go to choose 3D machining boundaries. So you're gonna see this module pop up all over the place. It's been integrated into probably over 20 different tool paths. You're gonna see a lot of it. The only ones that it's not added to is thread, circular, and bore, because those are based off of cylindrical geometry and you're not really selecting a, uh, an open contour for those. It has to be closed and thus not really uh, a useful tool for that. So chain mode, this is going to be uh, kind of the most flexible and probably the most commonly used method when you are choosing a 2D boundary. You can now switch between open and closed while you're making the selection. In the past, you had to double click on an edge to switch between open and closed. It was very vague. A lot of people didn't know that it was even there. Um, oftentimes when I was doing trainings, it was the first time they'd seen that capability. 
you used to click the line and then click it again and it would give you a little fly out menu where you could switch. Now you have this full larger menu where you can toggle between open and closed contour. A closed contour means it's going to try to close the loop. So no matter what edge you select, it will create a closed boundary. It will then machine all of the material inside of that boundary. If you want to machine material outside the boundary, you click that red arrow or you check the reverse button, which is a new feature. So now you can just check this reverse checkbox and that will switch which side of the contour you're cutting on. The open contour tool gives you the ability to create an open toolpath that extends to the stock boundary. So by default, if you have an open boundary, it will extend either tangent, parallel, or to the closest boundary, which is going to be your stock boundary. And we'll talk about this a little more in the live demo, and it might make more sense then. But with open contours, this is when you have an open boundary, like I show in the image here, uh, or you're just trying to machine a portion of a region and you don't need to close out that contour. You'll notice there's now a distance option where if you are extending your curve tangent, you can actually put in a distance as opposed to um, only going to the stock contour, you can have it extend as far out as you want and it will machine all the material within those bounds. So a little bit, you know, kind of just an improvement to the user interface here. Um, and I just think it makes it a little more clear what you can do and it makes it easier to access these tools when you're using Chain. Um, pockets has been simplified a little bit. If you activate pockets mode, it actually won't let you select any edges. It forces you to choose faces, um, which in the past, if you chose a face, it would then switch to pocket mode, but it wouldn't tell you that. So what this does is it limits your selections. So you can't accidentally click the wrong thing. You can then check a box that says select same plane faces. And what that does is it finds all the pockets that are on the same plane in two dimensions. So here, all of these pockets reside on that same plane as the selected one. So it chooses all of those at the same time. This is extremely helpful if you have a part like this where there's a lot of pockets because you don't have to go and choose them one by one. And it can really speed up your programming. So kind of just a, a nice to have. Um, but I'm glad that Autodesk made this update because it does speed, really streamline things on 2D parts like this. Another key feature this is this new silhouette mode. I'm highlighting what I find to be kind of the most useful, and silhouette is certainly one of those things. What this will do is it looks at your model and it tries to find the inner and outer boundaries. It's basically like if you held this part above a piece of paper and you traced the shadow. That is what silhouette does. So even on a part that doesn't have um, straight sidewalls or it has split faces and um, complex curvature to it, it will just take the outer boundary and create a silhouette for you. You can then filter if you want to use either all loops, outer loops, or inner loops. So here on this specific image, if I chose outer loops, it would limit so that it only chooses that outer boundary and it would eliminate those uh, hole sections in the middle where you've got those holes that it picked up. So this is really helpful for specifically um, 2D contour. I found this really helpful for 2D contour because oftentimes on the part like this, one of your final operations is going to be machining the outer surface to make sure that it's perfectly flat and clean. And without silhouette, it can be tricky to select that outer boundary without it looping in some of the inner surfaces. Um, so this really is helpful. And I'll show you this live and you're going to probably understand a little better. Uh, but really helpful in complex 2D and 3D parts. And uh, it, it eliminates a lot of the sketching that I would used to have to do uh, or split face to fix this issue. So that's kind of the, the summary of the 2D boundaries and chaining. Uh, chain, pocket, and silhouette are probably the most commonly used. When it comes to 3D, you have to spend a little more time thinking about how you want to contain your tool. 
by default, what Fusion 360 is going to do is it's going to try to machine any surface that it can see. So if you're coming down in the Z direction here, it's going to try to machine every surface that is perpendicular or even at a curved angle to the Z axis. Um, you have to decide how you want to bound the tool and how you want the tool to interact with the edges of your boundary in order to get a tool path that actually machines where you want it to. So there's several things you can use. One of them is boundaries. The other is angular limits. And the third is a surface um, limit or a sketch boundary limit. So there's several ways you can handle this um, if you can't get any of the default methods to work. So the first thing you're going to encounter with the 3D toolpath is your, your boundaries. So how you want the tool to be bounded. The default is typically silhouette, which they show in the middle here. And silhouette is going to take your tool and machine all the surfaces all the way out to the part silhouette. So again, if you took this part, put it down on a piece of paper and sketched the outline, that would be your silhouette. So it machines everything it can out to the edges. Bounding box, what it does instead is it takes a box and wraps your part inside of it. So basically it's the minimum square boundary uh, that your part would fit in. So if you took your part and you put it in a cardboard box, the smallest box that your part would fit in, that's your bounding box. So it goes and it squares out the corners a little bit uh, and it also machines all the surfaces. Now, most of the time you're gonna be using selection. What selection allows you to do is choose the edges of boundaries you do not want the tool to cross over and the toolpath stops at those edges. So here in the selection method, edges of these pockets were chosen, so the tool only machines between the boundaries that have been selected, so it doesn't try to machine down into those pockets, uh, which are likely going to be done with a 2D toolpath here. So those are your three bounding options. When you go to use selection, one thing to note is that selection, you can choose sketch boundaries or you can choose the edges of your component. So sometimes if you can't get the edge that you want, you can just create a new sketch in the design environment and override the selection with that sketch. So always keep that in mind when you're using selection. The next thing that you will see after you set up your boundary is the containment options. Now this is how you want the tool to interact with the edge of your boundary. So tool inside means that it will go up until the tool diameter is tangent to the boundary specified. So here, the edge of this square was chosen as the boundary. And so if you do tool inside, the, the tool path stops once the edge of your end mill is tangent to that boundary, it will not cross over the boundary. If you do tool center, it will go up until the center line of your tool is in line with the selected boundary. That is the default and probably the most commonly used method. Occasionally, you might want to make sure that you completely break that edge or you might want to roll over the edge a small amount. That is where tool outside comes into play. What tool outside will do is it'll actually bring the tool all the way up until the tool is completely on the other side of the boundary and tangent to it. So it's kind of like the inverse of tool inside. Really good if you need to roll over the edge a small amount. So these are your three options for how you want to contain the tool and how you want the tool to interact with the edge of that boundary. Now the other thing you'll see, which is really critical when you're working with a angled surface is contact point boundary. If your tool is running down a surface and you're cutting with the side of a ball nose mill, if you enable this feature, what it will do is it will extend your boundary just enough so that the contact point of the side of the end mill 
will go all the way to the edge of the boundary. Otherwise, it will stop once the tool center line reaches the edge of that boundary. This is often used in combination with the tool center containment. If you combine that with the contact point boundary being enabled, it allows you to eliminate any burrs at the edge of a really steep surface when you're machining in three axes simultaneously. Now, if you can't get any of these methods to work quite the way that you want, you can combine them with the slope angle limits. So further down on the geometry panel, you're going to see this slope option. So when you check the box, you get two inputs, the from slope angle and the to slope angle. These are your limitations. And so it will cut away portions of the tool path that are not between these bounds. So zero degrees would be parallel to the XY plane. 90 degrees is perpendicular to the XY plane. So zero is flat, 90 degrees would be vertical. So sometimes you might want to limit your toolpath to only machine shallow or flat surfaces. So the image here shows from zero to 30, which means it will machine the flats and up until it gets to a surface at an angle of 30 degrees and then it stops. So the steep sections of these surfaces are cut away and it only machines the shallow ones. If you switch to, for instance, from 30 degrees to 90 degrees, it's only going to machine the really steep sections between 30 and 90 degrees. So this is a really neat way to um, limit your strategy to only areas that it is efficient. So oftentimes when you're using a parallel toolpath, like what is shown here, parallel works really well on flat surfaces. It does not work very well on steep ones because you're machining down. And oftentimes the ball nose just does not clean up that surface very well. You'd rather run along the surface with something like a contour or a scallop. So this is a way to sort of break your toolpath up and use the most optimal method. So that's sort of a high level intro into some of the things I'm going to show. Um, I'm gonna get into a live demo here, uh, which should clear up any of the questions you might already have. Uh, but I wanted to show you these techniques on a fusion model so you get a better feeling for how this actually translates. So here I have a simple part. This is a, a primarily 2D or 2.5D part. All of these pockets are flat. I don't have any curvature. So this is gonna be primarily 2D toolpaths. Now, when I go to machine this, let's say I'm machining a 2D pocket. So I go to the 2D pocket operation. Let me just grab a flat end mill. And I'm ready to machine my pocket. Notice this geometry section here looks a little different. So again, in, in January, they updated this. Um, now I have three options, pockets, chain, and face contours, but then the drop down menu gives me the full list. So from the menu, if I have chain selected, now a chain flyout menu comes up and I can choose either closed or open before I even make any selections. With closed, what that means is if I choose a closed pocket, obviously it's going to just close that in. And if I click okay, it creates a toolpath that machines everything inside of that. Now, if you switch this to being an open pocket, so if I go to chain and I do open chain, notice I get some more settings. It says, how do you want to extend this? Tangent, closest boundary and parallel, the extension type, and then the reverse key here. So if I were to choose this pocket down here, so this pocket is an open pocket. Um, I want the tool to break the edge here. I don't want it to stop right at this one. So if I were to click this edge right here, because I have the open chain on, it loops it together, but it keeps it open. It does not include this straight edge right here because it does not have the requirement to create a closed pocket. So if I click OK, it gives me a preview of this toolpath. Now notice it picked up that open contour, but it added on everything in blue here. So if I click OK, you'll notice it adds in 
these operations, that machine material, all the way out to the stock boundary. So here's my stock model. And you can see I have a lot of extra stock outside of that boundary. And it machines all the way until it reaches that edge. What it's doing is, if I click the little gear right here, I can open this chain back up. So I'll click the gear, opens it back up. And I can see that the extension method is tangent, which means it takes the fillet right here, extends it tangent all the way out to the stock boundary, and then closes the loop there. If I change this to closest boundary, it'll go straight out to the boundary. It does not create a tangent extension. So I'll click OK, click OK, and notice now it still machines to the stock boundary, but it goes straight out after it hits that fillet. So that's what that extension does, is it sort of decides how it's going to enclose um, this pocket. Now you can override what that extension location is using the stock contours option. So if I did want to use the tangent method, or I did want to use the closest boundary method, but I don't want it to go all the way out to the stock, maybe I want to bring that in a little bit, you can actually override your stock contours. So I could go into stock contours and activate that. And what it'll do is it'll show me what it's using. So it shows me in yellow here, the edge of the stock that it's using for that extension. Now, if I want to bring this in, I can use the selections here to update that. And you'll notice I have that same module here where I can selectively choose how I want to approach this. So if I do chain, I could go through and I can just sort of chain together these edges. And if I activate open chain, it lets me choose the edges of the part as my new stock boundary and I'll click OK. And so now, it stops when it gets to that edge. So if I click OK, I've updated where it's extending to. So now it extends just enough to break the edge of that stock boundary, but it does not go any further than that. So it goes until the tool reaches the edge of that boundary and overlaps. So now I'm gonna get a tool path that's a little more efficient. I'll still hit that fillet, but I'm not wasting my time. I'm not wasting time machining material out here. Um, I've brought the stock boundary in to the part edge as opposed to to the stock edge. So using those chains, you'll see that module come up in pocket selections and the stock contour selections. So you may use it multiple times in the same toolpath. Now, if you want more control than that, one thing that um, I have sort of used occasionally over the years is you'll notice the way it's leading in right now, it's coming horizontally into this, ta into this tangent fillet. If you wanted to smooth out how it approaches this pocket, you can have it follow a sketch contour instead of your surface contour. So this is where you can really get fancy with your tool paths. And the more you know about fusion and sketching, the more often you'll probably use this approach because it is really easy to implement. I can just go back into my sketch. I'm gonna create a sketch on this face. And I'm just gonna go ahead and project some of these edges. So I'm gonna grab the edges of my pocket. So you have to include geometry you want to still machine. But then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create a new um, curve or a tangent arc here that comes out. And let's just make this like a 15 millimeter extension. I'm not gonna to get too fancy with this right now, but what I'm doing is I'm creating this sort of um, radius extension that I can use to control how it leads into this pocket. Because now when I go to manufacture this, I can go back into my tool path. And this time, instead of using stock contours to override this, for my chain, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new chain. And instead of choosing the edges of my part, I'm going to do an open chain where I choose the edges of my sketch, which gives me even more control over how this toolpath is going to turn out. 
So now I'm choosing those loops that I added in. It still fills in the boundary between the two, but now I'm gonna get sort of a nice rounded approach into that fillet instead of a 90 degree cut. So if you can't get it figured out with the default settings or the lead in and lead out settings, always remember that sometimes it's faster just to create a sketch of the toolpath that you want. You're not limited to just choosing faces and edges on the part. You can use sketches as well, especially in 2D. So just some things to think about there when you're using that chain command. Now, when you're doing pocket, what you'll notice is when you go to do a 2D pocket and you activate that pocket selection. So I activate pockets. Notice it won't let me choose edges anymore. I can only choose faces now. It does not let me choose the edge, but I could go through and choose a pocket one by one or if you check the box for select same plane faces, it automatically located all of those pockets that are on the same plane. So I can click OK, click OK, and now it adds in toolpaths for all of those pockets simultaneously. And the nice thing is I can update the settings and have it update all of those at the same time. So the pockets feature just overrides the ability to choose edges and it gives you some automation tools as well. So pretty straightforward there with pockets. Now, last thing I wanted to show on 2D is silhouette. So I mentioned this before, and this comes into play, particularly on parts like this, where you're trying to create a 2D contour on a 3D part. So on this part, if I go to 2D contour, this is where I found a use for silhouette right out of the gate. As I go, I'm sure I'll find more ways to use this. But if I create a 2D contour here and I do it using the chain method, so I'll show you what happens with chain. Now this used to be the only way you could do this was the chain method. Uh, silhouette didn't used to exist. In the past, you'd have to do this where I would have to choose, for instance, this edge right here. And I have to go through it, but notice there's a split face right here where I have a curved surface coming into a flat one. This happens a lot of times when you import a step model or you're working with like a mold, you might have splits midway through a face. And so it's trying to loop together this split right here. So I'd have to sort of go through manually and choose the edges that I want to make this work. And that can be tedious depending on how complex your part is. Now, the nice thing with Silhouette is I don't have to go through and do any of that chaining. I can just go to Silhouette. It finds all the silhouettes. I'm gonna use the Outer Loops filter. So it only chooses that outer loop. Click OK. And now I have my silhouette chosen for that toolpath. And I can always move the height down if I want to, to the model bottom. And I get this nice, clean contour toolpath that's gonna to take the side of the tool and bring it right along the side of the part, just like that, without having to do any sketching or having to chain together geometry. It's really quick, it's really efficient. Um, it takes out a lot of the errors that can happen when you're trying to chain together multiple segments, and it's gonna be a smoother tool path. So that silhouette tool is new. You'll see that in there uh, in the drop-down menu along with those uh, other options for chaining and pocketing. Let's talk a little bit about 3D. So we've gone through some of the 2D options. 3D boundaries tend to be a little bit more complicated. Um, we can start by looking at uh, this part here. If I am machining this surface, there's a lot of complexity here. I've got these pockets, these holes, these bores to deal with, as well as some of these smaller chamfer features. This is where uh, boundaries become very critical. So if I go in to do, for instance, let's say I'm just doing a parallel operation. I'm gonna go ahead. That is a flat amount, or sorry, a ball nose. If I use the bounding box command, so for my machining bounder, activate bounding box, and I just say, okay, this is what you get. Again, it takes the tool, machines everything it can see, and it goes up until it reaches a square boundary around the edge of the part. 
if I switch to silhouette, it does the same thing, but it stops when it gets to a silhouette of the part. So that contains it a little better. It doesn't allow to, it to go over the edge, but it still is machining these internal pockets that I don't want it to. So this is where oftentimes, you know, unless you have a very simple part, you're probably going to need to use the selection tool. Silhouette and bounding box work well if you have a part that doesn't have any holes or pockets cutting into it, like a very simple surface. But here, that's just not the case. And in the real world, that's usually not the case. So if I go to selection, I can choose the boundary I want. So this allows you to choose, for instance, the outer edge. So I want to keep the tool inside of that chamfer all the way around. And if you choose anything on the inside of that, so my green line there is my outer boundary, if I were to add to this selection, it will contain the tool between any of the selections that you make. So if I choose some of these additional edges here, of my pockets and my holes, notice in the new module here, each of these shows up as a feature in this box. So any one of these, I can go into the settings and I can change from enclosed to an open chain. And I can select for each one of these how I want it to approach. I can also add in different types of selections. If I just click OK now, the tool is limited in between all of those boundaries that I selected. So it only machines the surfaces that I want. And that looks really good. Usually that's the first step is making sure that you can keep the tool limited to where you want. The second step is figuring out how you want the tool to handle the edges of your boundary. So right now, you will notice that it is machining until the tool is centered on the boundary. So it goes up until the tool center line in, is at the center of that edge. That's the default. Usually that's what you want. If you want to roll over the edge, you can change this to outside of boundary. And now notice the tool rolls over the edge, which in this case is not gonna work very well because it's going to break up and machine over the edge of some of these chamfers and you're gonna get some strange segments in here. Usually that's not the case on a part like this. If I did tool inside, there's not much that it can reach without going over that boundary. If I had a smaller tool, I could probably do tool inside and get a little bit closer. But in this case, tool center is probably going to be exactly what I want. Now, the other thing in here is this contact point boundary. I talked about this in the presentation earlier. If you leave this off, the tool is going to stop as soon as it reaches that boundary. But when you get to a steeper section like this down here, it stops when the tool gets to the center point of the boundary. It does not go until the side of the ball nose reaches that boundary. So if you want to get a slightly cleaner finish, you can activate contact point boundary, click OK. And you'll notice now it rolls over the edge just a little bit. I probably don't want it to roll over here. So again, I'm going to need to adjust that. But on a surface like this, this is probably what I want. I probably want it to extend past the edge until the ball reaches the surface boundary as opposed to the tip of the tool or the center line of the tool. So there's some nice uh, features in there you can use to sort of adjust what your boundary is, how the tool interacts with that boundary as you go. Now, if, like I said, you want more control than that, there's more tools down here in the geometry tab. There's five more sections in here. Slope is a very easy way to handle scenarios like this. So for slope in here, if I was having an issue like this where it's trying to machine some of these flat sections, I could try to fix that with slope. So if I activate slope, again, it's a limit. So if I say I only want to machine from 0 0.1 to 89.9, it cuts out some of those very vertical sections because they're either flat or they're vertical. The other thing you can do 
in here is you can use it to limit your toolpath to where it's going to perform best. So like I showed before, if I go from zero to 30, it will only machine those surfaces. So it does not try to machine these very steep sections in here because that's not where the tool is going to perform very well. Then I could grab a scallop toolpath and I could do a derived operation off my parallel. So I'll right click, create derived, 3D scallop. This allows me to use the same tool, same settings. And all I'm going to do is go into my slope. And I'm going to say from 30 to 90. So the scallop toolpath is added to all the sections I didn't touch with my parallel. So you can create overlapping toolpaths or what's called a steep and shallow toolpath, which is available in the machine extension as well, which does basically the same thing, but it does it automatically. So this allows you to sort of blend together strategies that work best for specific areas of your geometry. So slope angle in combination with boundaries is usually going to get you exactly what you want. Now, the last thing here that's sort of a bonus that I didn't talk about much in the blog post, but I realized later that it is a useful tool, is sometimes the boundaries and the slope angle and all of this just does not work the way you want. Um, sometimes it's just uh, either a bad combination of, of tooling and surfaces and you just can't get it to work or uh, the settings don't lend themselves to what you're trying to do. There is a third way you can sort of limit your toolpath, and that is using a surface instead of a boundary. So you're going to override the surface that's being used for a specific operation. So on a part like this, if I go to create a 3D milling toolpath, so let's say I create a new scallop toolpath, and I grab my flat end mill or my ball nose here, and I'm ready to machine these surfaces. If I do selection, I, it only gets me so far. So I can go ahead and choose some of these boundaries. Okay. And it looks good, right? It limits my tool to just those surfaces between those boundaries and all looks good. But there's going to be a lot of uh, the tool lifting up and down, and you're going to really get sort of a toolpath is going to take a while to run. So the other option is say, well, if I want to just ignore these pockets on my first pass and then come back in with a 2D toolpath to break up that surface, you can override the model with a new surface and have that drive that specific toolpath. So to do that, I'm going to design. I'm going to create a new surface. What's really cool is what you could also do is from manufacture, you can create a new manufacturing model. So you could also create a new um, model just to use for that. So I can create a manufacturing model, which allows me to remove features or create services and things like that just for the sake of manufacturing or machining. Or if you just don't mind having it in your top level model that's fine too you're just going to suppress it anyways either way what you're going to do is create a patch surface and i just patch together this entire body so what i've done is i've created this surface here that represents the top of my model so this is what i'm going to use to machine instead of this surface here i'm going to use this wrapped surface that sort of just um, is patched right along the top so now if I go into manufacture, I can use that surface. So now if I use that surface, I actually don't even have to have it shown. I can just choose it from the list. So I'm gonna to go to scallop. And this time, instead of using boundaries, I'll keep my outer boundary, but instead of choosing those inner boundaries, I'm gonna go ahead and go to model and I'm gonna override my model surfaces by choosing this from the browser and I'm gonna Deselect includes setup model, so it does not include my stock or my um, body in this. Click OK. And the toolpath I get basically ignores these pockets here, just machines right over the top. 
So we get a nice clean toolpath that ignores those pockets and holes and is continuous. And it's going to be able to be something I can run faster because there's fewer changes in direction. It's going to lead to a nice surface finish on the top. Then I can come back in and machine those pockets out. Or I can just cut right over the top of them if I wanted to. So sometimes the selections don't quite iron themselves out or you can't get it to work. And always remember that you can use sketches or surfaces to override what you're actually machining, um, which is really helpful in a scenario like this um, or something where I have uh, tight features that I need to just ignore on that first level uh, semi-finish. So things to keep in mind, you know, you have some of those new 2D chaining and boundary features. Um, those lend themselves well to 2D toolpaths, but they also can be really helpful when you're creating a um, boundary or a containment option in 3D as well. So hopefully that was uh, informative for you guys. It's good to see uh, some of this in action and give you guys ideas for uh, the next project you're working on or the next uh, part you're trying to machine. So what I'll do right now is just open things up to uh, uh, questions. If you guys have any, we'll get those answered. And uh, I appreciate you sitting in on today's webcast.